So I finally played Firewatch. Emphasis on finally, being I mentioned it in January 2017. At the rate this channel's going, Jet Set Radio Future will be covered in 2020. Ah, right on schedule. So... Let's get scratching. When you've consumed hundreds of games over two decades, patterns repeat themselves. It begins to not even matter what perspective, setting, or platform a game uses, there will be enough shared mechanics for you to enter autopilot. Use this noisemaker to distract. Press A to enter cover. Avoid the oncoming objects. But Jet Set Radio for the Dreamcast isn't so easy to define, mechanically or stylistically. It's not a traditional extreme sports game like Tony Hawk because its tricks aren't nearly as frequent or fundamental to progress. It's not a completely linear game because missions can be tackled in various orders and there's a variety of characters that can be used almost anywhere at any time. It's not an open world game, but stages will combine multiple sections into a larger whole. The game's controls don't follow a template that's carried through the 2000s either. You don't hit Y to grind, it's done automatically. Tricks aren't made by pressing buttons, you merely jump at the appropriate time. Graffiti isn't a bonus, it's how you complete levels. Even in premise, there's gangs, but they're not Crips or Bloods. There's cyborgs, angry ladies, and Godzilla fans. There's a totalitarian government using a militarized police force to find a record that summons Satan. The development team were inspired by Fight Club, but this is the game's opening tone. Hey you! And I kind of love it. Seeing burly men wear shark tooth masks rollerblading through Tokyo puts a smile on my face. Blowing up helicopters with spray paint is satisfying. And would you just listen to this menu music? There's no nostalgia here. Humming the bass lines, an absolute classic. At first I thought these teenagers looked dopey, never remaining still, but slap this track on and I'm mimicking along. Though judging by the view count of its soundtrack, there's much more than one banger. One, two, three, four, five, six, hit it! In fact, the only track that really got on my nerves was Super Brother, purely for a bridge that's the longest 60 seconds I've ever felt. Apart from that, everything from the original work to the licensed track appealing Sega's demand for two extra levels in America is great. Frankly, if y'all told me this game featured the remixed version of Rob Zombie's Dragula, mandated to appear in every 90s game ever, I would have made this video years ago. Not to imply Jet Set's strength comes purely through the speakers. Its visuals are equally unique. The locked frame rate and fuzzy faces are blemishes on an otherwise vibrant image whose style hasn't diminished. Cell shading today seems to come with apprehension, likely stemming from poor implementations of it in both amateur and high-level projects, pushing the stereotype that cell shading is done to mask a lack of detail behind style. But that's not true today, and it wasn't true back then either. Cell shading and dated textures don't overwrite the varied lines on beach skates, or how densely packed the buildings of Tokyoto are. These details would exist regardless of shading. The effect is merely done to cement its exaggerated cartoony aesthetic that's less pronounced on a typically blocky late 90s 3D model, translating to an Ultra HD monitor better than it has any right to. For reference, this is Pro Skater 2 on the Dreamcast. Jet Set Radio might have released when the realism obsession began, but its comic book and cartoon aesthetics remain contemporary as a result, not unlike the 2.5D, 8, and 16-bit games that came before it. Timeless works aren't always those with universal imagery or subject matter. Sometimes their work which captured their era so perfectly, it remains distinct. They're timelessly of their time, if that makes any sense. Now I know what you're probably asking right now. What about the gameplay? The gameplay. 
It's not bad, but it's not very good either. For reference, this is what I spent my time with earlier this year, the original Tomb Raider, i.e. tank control Lara. This reportedly slim, sexy archaeologist moves like a refrigerator packed with bowling balls. I really didn't think I'd finish one level of this game, but once I got used to the jump alignment and backwards hop, I find myself not only being competent, but being cocky. Jumps that tensed me up in hour one didn't phase me by hour six. Tomb Raider handles as it does to create a unique sandbox that's rewarding to master. Jet Set Radio handles as it does more because the team didn't know any better. I can't fault them for camera controls, the Dreamcast lacked one crucial feature, and the 7 Gen ports did bind that second stick, but it doesn't resolve the game's tendency to shove said camera up your ass. This was criticized even at release, and I think it's a large part of why that 7 Gen port was thrashed by the outlets which praised the original. It's a problem not merely for the annoyance of missing a jump, but also the level design that requires precise timing both to reach objectives and escape law enforcement. Yet it's normal for the only thing you see to be your character and the sky. This is the reason Tony Hawk's Pro Skater follows your character from above, to assure players always see where they're headed. Without that ability, the game too often degenerates into trial and error. It doesn't help either characters themselves are hefty to maneuver. The worst instances of this are in the sewers and rooftops, which in the third act are packed together. Yay! The sewers are highly reliant on timing, and should you be the slightest bit slow during a halfpipe, your character on the edge will turn around while you're holding forward. Rooftops, meanwhile, are horrendous because the game isn't consistent about when your character can rollerblade over geometry and when they can't. Even more infuriating, the game hosts races against rivals in both locations, leading to situations where you're restarting entirely because of one measly bump. Did I mention the races only have a single dot on the map to follow? I'm all for challenge, but this is beyond stupid. Imagine if Burnout Paradise put your destination here. And then there's the tagging missions. You're supposed to tag three enemies ten times. Sounds easy enough. Only contact in any matter damages and sets you back, but you also need to be less than a foot away to tag. Falling behind eats up time, but they will also pause for you to catch up. In essence, these missions combine all of the game's inadequacies, precision with heavy characters and unrefined mechanics, and pursuits without consequence. They feel like a prototype, a rough concept of an idea the team aimed for but didn't have the time to refine, only it ended up in the main product multiple times at key points in the story. And every time the AI glitched, I was grateful. Now, I wouldn't call this game bad like GameSpot did. You can get a hold of the controls, and I was certainly far better by the end than where I started. But unlike Tomb Raider, that improvement wasn't rewarding, as all of the problems remained. Nailing a jump didn't open itself to a set of unique gameplay mechanics, it just meant I didn't need to restart a level. It felt less like learning a skill but memorizing a minefield. Granted, there's absolutely those who have mastered this control scheme, and I'm not one of them. There is enjoyment grooving to the perfect tune while chaining together rails and exquisite jumps, especially when squeezing a couple tags out in the process. But sadly, that flow's often interrupted, by design in the case of the biggest tags, and by accident in the case of controls and level design. I am confident in saying that had Jet Set Radio lacked its art style and music, it wouldn't be the fondly remembered title it is today. But I should clarify, that's not an insult. I've said for years that presentation is key to a player's enjoyment. Appealing visuals and sounds isn't required in the same way that furniture isn't required. Just because gameplay is king, that doesn't mean everything else is worthless, and by god is Jet Set Radio proof of this. Its gameplay's average, at best, yet I didn't drop it until the credits rolled, with more smiles than screams, and if you're the sort of person who's enjoyed games as old or older than you are, Jet Set Radio is absolutely worth experiencing for the first time. While playing, I constantly pointed at the screen, recognizing sounds and visuals I had no idea stemmed from this effort by Smilebit, but the biggest moment came from its sequel. The fondest memory I've got from my QA job was playing Lethal League in the office. Hosting four-player matches huddled around the 4x3 Dell monitor like children playing split-screen on a combo TV. 
Finally playing Jet Set Radio Future rekindled that memory when talking to a character made me go, ah, I get it now. That came shortly after drooling over immediate improvements made over its predecessor. Hefty characters are out. Instead, they're light, fast, agile, and have a speed boost. Momentum is much quicker to obtain and maintain, and the game runs natively at a buttery smooth 60 FPS. What you're seeing is the game running on CXBX, an Xbox emulator, at 4K. And frankly, it's a near flawless transition. Even the menus look beautifully sharp. The pixelation when boosting is the only giveaway this isn't a native experience. It's the closest you'll ever get to a remaster, and it looks great. The detail hasn't faded, neither has the distinct character designs and brilliant scenery. Future isn't a sequel, it's a requel. The developers themselves saw it this way internally to have complete creative freedom. So the premise, core cast of characters, and general attitude is the same as the original Jet Set Radio but nearly everything's been doubled. There's 23 playable characters, 16 levels, a 10-hour campaign, and most famously, two hours of music. It's a textbook follow-up. Future does everything Jet Set Radio did bigger, badder, smoother, and faster. Yet, I didn't like this game as much as I thought I would during the early hours, and that comes from what it changed. Future abandons the stage selection and time limits of Jet Set for an open world structure, freeing the player to grind around the map for as long as they want. This really threw me for a loop at first. It was jarring to come from a game that punishes you for poor lines or graffiti tagging to the requel holding virtually no punishment for failure and tagging reduced to pulling the right trigger. But sometimes the problem isn't the game, it's the person playing. This was one of those instances. Because while Future has much in common with its predecessor, it also has lots in common with 3D platformers of the time. Once I viewed the game through this lens, fully exploring every map, finding secrets, unlocking characters, and learning how the trick system incorporates with your momentum, I became much more appreciative of this game's design. And it's a game that improves with time. The soundtrack becomes more varied, levels get larger and more intricate, and differences in characters becomes more pronounced. The subtle refinements also make it hard to go back to the original game. Not only is the frame rate improvement such a blessing, the controls themselves in turning, jumping, and grinding are just more satisfying to pull off. It feels less like influencing a wrecking ball and more like being a light, agile teenager on rollerblades. The momentum and boost mechanics are also a real game changer. There was momentum in the last game, but it felt very fixed. Holding on the right trigger constantly and exploiting the grinding system to build speed became the bulk of gameplay towards the end. Now, momentum can essentially be achieved anywhere by timing your tricks and boost. It creates really satisfying moments when you start to chain together sections of the map that would otherwise be impossible. So the controls are less stressful overall, but that doesn't mean it's relaxing. In fact, there were several moments this game made me scream at the monitor, primarily via the grinding and its open world layout. Just to clarify, grinding, not grinding. Though this game is kinda padded, more on that later. Remember the half-pipe issue I mentioned, where your character interprets forwards as backwards? That's now an impossibility due to grinds being far more magnetized, most probably to account for the increased speed. But it's that speed and magnetism which leads to occasions where your character is sent the wrong way, and without a button to end the grind, your only option is to risk jumping in levels that can be six stories tall with no shortcuts to return. What amplifies this problem the most, however, is the camera. Despite having an entire analog stick to spare, Smilebit, following Japan's stubbornness during the era, only use it to look in first person when you're standing still, with the most obnoxious auto center I've felt. Resetting the camera is reserved to the left trigger, rather than binding it as a dedicated grind function, which is all that was needed to resolve the previous issue. The worst it gets is where you have to spray a discount Tachikoma over a set of stairs that's six stories tall. 
and one missed jump or missile sends you all the way down over the six stair oval the spider never travels down in a game with magnetized rollerblades that let you go vertical. There's no vital damage done because health packs are on the first level. There's no punishment for poor gameplay because the boss fight isn't timed and there's no hazards until you're on the top floor. When fighting this same boss later on in a flat field, I took it out in seconds. All this climbing does is waste your time. Speaking of which, the original game might have only been five hours long, but it really ran out of steam after three. Levels started to repeat themselves, objectives became more restrictive, and the two American levels enforced by Sega for the game's North American release are easily the weakest. Future manages to hold interest for longer, but it's a 10-hour game that runs out of breath at 7. There's a racing chapter that forces you down the same boring course three times. There's no fast travel, forcing you down the same routes repeatedly. And the most obnoxious, one of the characters required to make progress in the story, rotates between these three stages. In one instance, coming to the level I was on, only for him to travel to the opposite side of the world on my way to him. Even the levels, for as much fun as they are to explore and master routes for, don't feel nearly as intricately designed as its competitors with multiple dead ends, questionable geometry, and restrictive routes. Many stages feel less like one big environment and more like four Jet Set levels stitched together. Suffice it to say, Jet Set Radio Future, while an improvement from the original game, is let down by various problems that only got more prominent with time. Though I will say, for as much as my shtick is to judge old games by today's standards, Future does a good job. Its gameplay isn't great, but that could be said of many games from this time. Have you tried playing Grand Theft Auto 3 recently? Future's not that dated, and there's a whole heap of games that look and sound worse than it does today. And despite Future's attempts to be more gray and gritty to appeal to trends of the time, it still carries the charm. I've got hours of music added to playlists, unforgettable character designs, and Professor K's Jet Set Radio burned into my brain. The worst thing a game can do is have you forget it immediately after turning the system off. And it's for certain that I won't be forgetting either of these games. They are <clears throat> iconic. And what happens when you make an iconic game? Eventually, it influences a new one. Hover isn't Jet Set Radio. It's got no rollerblades, no beat gum tab or Professor K, no cell shading, and no Sega. What Hover is, is complete freedom. Automatic grinding is gone. So too are the literal signposts for wall running and symbols for graffiti. There's no cutscenes and no separation between single and multiplayer content. You're free to just run, glide, and grind like an absolute madman, and after spending tens of hours with games that couldn't trust me to time a button press other than jump, Hover is like fresh water in the Sahara. While SmileBit's efforts are okay platforming experiences with superb music and visuals, here, gameplay is king. Hover is a game where the simple act of running and jumping is emphatically satisfying. Movements fast but controllable, weighty yet responsive, consistent, and dynamic. How a game feels is difficult to quantify, but where Jet Set Radio and Future are games whose systems you learn to work around, Hover is a playground. It doesn't say, there's no sign, you can't wall run there. You can wall run on a moving vehicle for all it cares. This city isn't replete with dead ends, restrictive jumps, or single routes. Whatever gets you to a destination is a solution. Like Warframe, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is so much fun, I get tunnel vision, consumed in finding hidden collectibles, building speed, or getting the highest bounce, rather than accomplishing my objective. And it only gets more impressive when delving into this game's development. Nearly 4,000 backers raised $100,000 to build a futuristic free-running parkour game inspired by Jet Set Radio and Mirror's Edge on Kickstarter and its gameplay is more immediately enjoyable than both. Mirror's Edge Catalyst doesn't have this type of mechanical freedom. When I nail a time trial, it wasn't from maintaining momentum, it was figuring out where to use the obscenely underused grappling hook. Jet Set Radio has its moments of brilliance, but is too often punctuated by areas that only have one solution lacking in rhythm. 
With Hover, even the obstacle courses required for certain missions are slightly different every time because wall running isn't a pre-baked animation. It's a mechanic that works in tandem with your momentum, energy, and angle. It's damn refreshing to play a movement-based game with this amount of freedom in its mechanics and worth playing because of it. But there's a catch. When I said Hover is the opposite of Jet Set Radio, I meant it. The gameplay might be great, but virtually everything around it isn't. Most devastating of which is the structure. Future had its speed bumps in the campaign, awkward pauses between areas where you're traveling to the next experience rather than in the experience. But that's the default state of Hover. For some reason, I assume due to the low budget, this game is structured like an MMO. Lifeless NPCs stand around waiting for you and your friends to gather in a circle to toss balls into a net. Now, Jet Set Radio's objectives were hardly the Da Vinci Code, but they were, and this is ironic, freeing. Tag X amount of walls and Y amount of time is a setup that's simple enough for anybody to understand, but flexible enough for them to come up with a unique solution. Here, those style of objectives are side missions. Meanwhile, the real missions are the most monotonous repetitions of fetch quests and races out there. What do I get to do in this all new location? Complete a race. After that, two more races. After that, a game ball match. And after that, two more matches that don't even work in a game where I've already done both multiple times. Hover's greatest sin is that it's boring. Despite having an amazing set of systems that by themselves are the most engaging aspect, it's boring. This sounds weird to say, but I genuinely believe this game would have been better off as a collectathon. Something akin to Saints Row 4's clusters, Crackdown's ability orbs, even 3D platformers of the time. Because should I continue revisiting this game, that's what I'm going to do, and I'd recommend you do the same. Ignore the mainline content as much as possible to embrace the freedom it allows. It's been 18 years since a Jet Set Radio game was officially released, cut off due to poor sales. The franchise's publisher has been pitched multiple times, notably by Kuju Entertainment in 2006 to make a third installment for the Wii, with no interest, unsurprisingly. Truth be told, Jet Set Radio is a cult series that was never handled properly to begin with. For example, Sega thought the original game was too Japanese for the American market which is why it added levels based on Chicago and New York. However, Future's move to being an Xbox exclusive was cited by its publisher as a response to Jet Set Radio being more successful in the US market, which is why Future debuted with the Xbox's launch in Japan. It's hard to say if Jet Set Radio not receiving a third installment was a blessing or a curse. On the one hand, Future made many improvements, on the other, Smilebit became assigned to Amusement Vision in 2003 before becoming officially defunct in 2004. They carry Jet Set Spirit in arcade titles like Ollie King, but it seemed that if Sega were to fund a third game, it would have been done with total reluctance. Happily, however, we might not need a third installment. Thanks to the developers of Lethal League, who announced Bomb Rush Cyberfunk, a true spiritual successor. Having proved themselves capable of emulating Jet Set's style right down to bringing on its composer while making their own awesome gameplay and refined sequel, there's potential in this team of people to make the most of it. They clearly love the franchise enough to carry its spirit, but also creative and talented enough to do things their own way. And while I can't say that I love Jet Set Radio or Future or Hover, I'm loving the idea of someone giving these games a chance to truly shine. Understand, understand, understand. Was you mentioning how you were going to cover JSR in 2020 in this video and then doing a JSR video now totally planned out in the long run? No. Can you shout out the Race of X subreddit? No. Have you considered playing Cosmic Break 2 with me? No. When are you going to make a good video? No. Can this be the thumbnail for the Halo Wars Years Later video? Yes. Of all the COD campaigns, which one made you feel the most emotional and which one made you laugh the hardest? World at War, mostly for its conclusion. Not the Russia fuck yeah ending. That was indulgent to say the least. 
but the nuclear bomb set to its most moving piece. It combined with the speech, bells, and text manages to get chills from me to this day. Modern Warfare 3 is probably the closest we've gotten to a Fast and Furious game, and I adore it for that. It takes Modern Warfare 2, understands the story is nonsense from the start, and embraces the insanity. Do you think EA will invest in a new Command & Conquer game in the coming years? It's hard to tell. EA put out a middle market gem in the form of Squadrons, but it also pushed Command & Conquer Mobile in the first place. It's anybody's guess, but I'm sure it'd be good for the genre if a big RTS finally came out that wasn't by Relic or Creative Assembly. When will you like strategy games? When I'm a boomer. When will you make more videos about racing games? Give it time.